What's up, guys, and welcome, daily theologians. Is the Trinity essential for our understanding of the gospel? Do all three members of the Trinity work in concert in the gospel, in our redemption? Why does it matter, and does the gospel actually exist without the Trinity? Did the early church understand the Trinity before the gospels were ever even written? Well, you're not going to want to miss this. Stick around as Dr. Steve Lawson and Dr. James White tackle this topic. So the doctrine of the Trinity is relegated and ignored by most Christians because in some ways we don't have anyone like the triune Godhead to compare anything to. And so to avoid error, people are very cautious. But I also think there's a lack of understanding about the truth of this doctrine. I think people are very cautious because they have not spent time studying it or understanding it. And a great place to go for this is Dr. Steve Lawson, and he's going to explain that the gospel stands or falls on our understanding of the Trinity. And I think if you stick with this video to the end, you will greatly understand this idea and be greatly encouraged. So here is Dr. Steve Lawson. The truth of the Trinity, that is the mighty atlas that upholds the doctrine of salvation. Salvation is Trinitarian. God the Father is Savior. God the Son is Savior. God the Holy Spirit is Savior. And in order for us to understand the salvation that is ours, we must understand it through the threefold lens of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. To see our salvation only through one member of the Godhead is to have a mere one-dimensional understanding of salvation. We must step back and see the larger spectrum of the grace of God that has been lavished upon us, that has come flowing down from heaven in all three persons of the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Trinity is essential to our understanding the doctrine of salvation. Theologian and church historian Ralph Kuyper has written, quote, the doctrine of the Trinity is basic to the Christian faith. It is no exaggeration to assert that the whole of Christianity stands or falls with the Trinity. And that is quite a statement, and I believe that it is true, that without the Trinity, every doctrine of the Christian faith comes tumbling down, and that it is the Trinity that upholds the doctrines that we believe. And nowhere is this more so than in the doctrine of salvation. So critical is this truth that J.I. Packer writes, quote, the Trinity is the basis of the gospel. And the gospel is the declaration of the Trinity in action. Close quote. No trinity, no gospel. So you can't have a gospel without the trinity accomplishing salvation. And this is essential. Every false view of justification and salvation has the members of the trinity working at odds with one another. But before we get into that uh, glaring problem, I want to talk about the inadequacy of not understanding the gospel this way because it becomes a very one-sided, very confused, very misunderstood understanding of redemption and what grace actually is and what Jesus actually did. And then how did we come up with the doctrine of the Trinity? So first, back to Steve Lawson. Not understanding the gospel of our salvation through the paradigm, through the lens of the Trinity, we have a woefully inadequate understanding of what salvation is. 
This is precisely what Paul writes about in these opening verses of the book of Ephesians. Paul cannot express the doctrine of our salvation to us without opening up the lens so that we can most fully see our salvation. As we will be looking at these verses, verses 3 through 14, three things that I want to say to you by introduction. Number one, in the original Greek, it is one long sentence. Verses 3 through verse 14 is one continuous sentence. And that is important because God desires that we see this as a unit of thought. It is fine in your systematic preaching expositarily through the book of Ephesians if you wanted to bring five messages on these verses or ten messages on these verses, but we must understand that it is a unit of thought and God desires us to see the whole, the macro. It's like flying over Manhattan, like flying over New York City. It's one thing to see just one of the skyscrapers. It is absolutely breathtaking to see all of the skyscrapers when you fly over. And so it is here only 10,000 times 10,000 times 10,000 more. To, to fly over the terrain of the teaching here on salvation and see the transcendent towering Godhead God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rising up from these pages to the heights of heaven is absolutely breathtaking. So the opening part of Ephesians 1 is what Dr. Steve Lawson is referring to. And when you see it rightly, instead of having a narrow view of the gospel, you have a bird's eye view of the big picture of God's redemptive plan from before the foundation of the world. The book of Ephesians is specifically interested in revealing the mystery of God's plan for the gospel, which involves all three members of the Godhead. And if you're still not convinced, every other view of the gospel is going to have the members of the Trinity fighting one another. You're going to have the Father sending the Son to redeem everybody, and then the Son uh, pays the debt for everybody, but then the Holy Spirit only regenerates some, and, and then the Father and the Son and the Spirit are all fighting one another. But this view of the gospel is inadequate. It undermines the unity of the Godhead, and it actually would result in Jesus sinning because uh, if he did not save all the sheep, according to John 10, then he failed to do the will of the Father. So the Arminian-Pelagian view, false views of the atonement, uh, actually undermine the sinlessness of Christ if you follow it through to its conclusion. Most people don't, but it's very serious to understand the gospel rightly because they're one in mission. And they are one in their saving mission. They are one in their saving purpose. They are one in their saving enterprise as they bring salvation to one and the same people. The Father does not decide to save one group, and then the Son decides to lay down His life for a different group, and then the Holy Spirit goes in yet a different direction and seeks to seal yet a different group of sinners. Instead, what we see is the perfect unity of the saving persons, persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Spirit working in reality as one Savior. One Savior, one God, three in person, one in essence. This is what we see clearly in the Bible. And people attack this. They say, well, it didn't develop till later. It's not explicitly stated. Well, just uh, as a word of caution, you have to recognize the exact phrase fallacy is a logical fallacy where people will say, show me in the Bible where it says blah, blah, blah. And then they'll make up a statement that is not in the Bible and say, see, as if we cannot arrive at things systematically, as if we cannot arrive at things from understanding the text as a whole. And the idea of the Trinity has existed 
from before the foundation of the world. In fact, there was perfect love in the triune Godhead before the foundation of the world ever existed. So love is not based on your free will. It has always existed. God had the ability to do what he wished, which is always good. So the uh, idea of the Arminian view of theodicy and stuff like that fails as well. But let's look at how early the doctrine of the Trinity was understood. Here is Dr. James White. Of the gutter between Malachi and Matthew. That's where the Trinity is revealed. What am I saying when I say that? The ultimate revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity is found in the incarnation, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, followed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God promised by Jesus to his disciples. And when did that happen? In the gutter between Malachi and Matthew. That had all happened. That was already the shared experience of the church before Matthew ever got the idea to write a gospel. Even if most people don't think Matthew is the first, even if it was Mark. We don't know the order. There's a lot of people who think they know, but we don't know the order. But let's just say, before a single word of Mark or James or any of Paul's epistles, whatever was the first word of the New Testament written, all of that incarnation, death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ, his ascension and enthronement into heaven and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, all that had already happened. And that's the revelation of the Trinity. The Trinity is most clearly seen in the ministry of Jesus, his life, death, burial, and resurrection, and the sending of the Holy Spirit to indwell believers. They're all called God. There's one God. It's very clear from the Bible that they are three in person, one in essence. There's one God, and there are three persons within the Godhead. It's very straightforward. The early church would have clearly understood this, even if people reject it. If they reject it, the reason for this is a lack of regeneration. It is a spiritual awakening to submit to the understanding and the truth of the gospel. You have to understand there's a difference between fully understanding the Trinity and sufficiently understanding the Trinity. There's a posture of humility and submission and understanding that comes in the life and the heart of the believer because Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice. They know me. They follow me. There's a spiritual nature to understanding the Bible. Oneness, Pentecostals, modalists, things of that nature, Mormons, false, false cults and false religions do not understand the Trinity rightly because they do not have the Holy Spirit. They cannot understand the things of God. So they are devoid of the spirit of God. But the Trinity has always been what God had promised. In fact, in the Old Testament, these verses, like in Joel, like in other places where Peter is quoting them about the Holy Spirit, uh, are from the Old Testament. Isaiah prophesying the coming of the Messiah, the sending of the Spirit, etc. These things are all in the Old Testament. So the New Testament is explaining the Old Testament. But let's look at this for just a moment. The Trinity is uh, is often under attack and cults often reduce biblical truth. Why? To make God comprehensible and understandable by their minds. Is this end the subject of God's word to their own reasoning and end in error? Nevertheless, the following verses are often used to demonstrate the doctrine the Trinity is indeed biblical. So Matthew 28, 19, go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we see the three persons of the Godhead there. First Corinthians uh, 12, 4 through 6, the variety of gifts, same spirit, there are varieties of ministries, the same Lord, varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. And then we see in 2 Corinthians 13 and 14 as well, there's a whole list of verses that we could go through. But what I want to encourage you to check out is a book by James White, and it is called The Forgotten Trinity. Why? Because the Trinity is indeed biblical. It is an essential for us to understand the gospel rightly. And it's all over the pages of the Bible. It's who God is and who God has always been. And we need to get up to speed on this as Christians. And we need to stop denying or hiding this idea because we've always affirmed the reality of the Trinity. That is who God is. God works together to accomplish salvation and redemption. And we have much to say on this issue. So if you haven't yet, please repent. Put all of your confidence in the life, in the death, in the burial, and the resurrection of the God-man Jesus Christ. Because there's coming a day in which uh, it will be too late. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. And if you're still watching this, take a moment and hammer that like button.
like the 95 theses and leave a comment below. Thank you so much and God bless.